Welcome. We have a full house and an exciting agenda, so I'm going to kind of jump into it. One thing you know about the community is it's all member driven. And so all the content and all the sessions that we put together are really an amalgamation of the, co the calls that we have with each member. And so for today, really when we talk to the members, one of the things that has really bubbled up to the top right now is this concept of the install base. I've heard words like protect the core or focus on the base or terms like put an economic moat around our install accounts. There's a lot of energy and a lot of interest within the community of how do we think about retention in this new economic environment and how do we nuance our discussions because different industries are being impacted by this pandemic to different degrees. And so we really want to have this session be that unveiling of a, a healthy conversation around retention strategies, emerging best practices. We also have some research to share with the members and as always make it very collaborative. One thing we're going to do this uh, session because of the success in prior sessions is we've actually gotten so much activity in the chat rooms that have been blowing up uh, from prior sessions. People are just so active in those that our Vice President of Customer Success, Jen Camber, she's going to be monitoring the chat room and making sure that your voice is being heard either in direct conversation and Q&A or through some of your questions and comments that come through the chat room. So, and also just to reiterate one other thing that Kasha mentioned, our community is growing so much now. If you don't mind just saying your name and company and title as you phrase a question because we're growing our membership at such a clip that and their ideas and perspective. So with that, we are excited uh, as every session, we have a, a member step up and today Ashvin has, um, and he is going to help lead our conversation uh, together around retention strategies. And what I love so much about this session is Ashvin's gonna unveil some research that he's been a part of in his company Gainsight. He's chief customer officer at Gainsight. So he has a great perspective of sharing what he's seeing from his own client interactions and what Gainsight is doing around retention, share with you some research that's uh, underway, and then also add a perspective of emerging best practices, what they're doing at Gainsight, what they see other customers doing. Um, also want to mention, because all of our members have such great backgrounds and skill, Ashvin's actually co-author of a book, Customer Success Professionals Handbook. I really encourage you We'll make sure we give a link to that book uh, for all the members to have access to. He's a true thought leader in customer success. We're thrilled to have him as a part of the community. And with that, I'll let him take over our conversation. Thank you, Ashwin. My pleasure. Sorry, I'm uh, having a little bit of a, um, a web issue, but hopefully you can all see my screen and uh, we can get started. Okay, thank you. Chad, you, you were super kind uh, in the introduction. I appreciate uh, the opportunity about um, customer success and the importance in the world that we currently live in. Um, so uh, Nick Mehta, who's the CEO of Gainsight, um, uh, put this up on Twitter and got a lot of attention, which I think there's so much truth to it right now. Every CEO and CFO and probably all of you um, spending on some of the vendors that sell into into your organizations are probably have a spreadsheet open that basically says there is a line and are you above the line and you get retained or are you below the line and you get cut and basically customer success whether you have CSMs as a profession as a role within your company or not customer success more broadly is the key to making sure that you stay above that line so very, very like customer success, there's no better time to think about it than now because install base to Chad's point earlier is the critical thing right now in most businesses. Um, and um, some of you or all of you will empathize with this, but in most businesses, folks are uh, cu customers and prospective customers are um, taking their time to make decisions. We're seeing new sales across the board, um, across the community decline rapidly uh, because folks are not making budget decisions at this point and spending decisions at this point. It's also your existing customers at this point need your help. And your existing customers also are keeping an eye out for who is there for them at this point. 
Um, and when they're making the decision to the earlier slide, they're scrutinizing both the, the value delivered or the outcomes delivered from each vendor and also the experience working with that vendor. It's almost like you need both to uh, make the decision and one is not sufficient to make the decision. Uh, and the final thing, again, not a surprise, generally every company is looking to consolidate spend, but that is magnified and accelerated in these times. If you have multiple tools, people are looking to consolidate those tools and the tech stack so that they can uh, not only save on costs, but also increase operational efficiencies. Most companies are either have frozen hiring or have gone through layoffs and, and uh, as such. And so you have fewer people to do as much or more uh, in this current climate. And so the fewer tools that you have to manage, the better. Um, so lots of reasons why customer success is existential in this climate that we are in. What we did was we reached out to about uh, 90 um, publicly traded and private um, cloud companies. Um, CEOs, CROs, CFOs, and CCOs to get a sense for a few questions about how they are forecasting retention in the install base in this market. Um, and like the unanimous thing that we heard from them, um, three quarters of them, believe churn will spike three plus percentage points over what they'd forecasted for the year. So a lot of companies are forecasting churn and retention um, to get worse than they'd originally thought at the beginning of the year. If you dive into that a little bit more, this might be helpful as you are also thinking about retention forecasting for your own businesses. Um, the dark blue line or basically what was your gross retention rate? So it's basically off the revenue that is up for renewal. How much are you going to retain? Um, Pre-COVID is the dark blue, and a post-COVID or adjusted gross retention rate is the light blue. Basically, um, if you were already a, a sticky business, meaning your retention rates were in the 95% plus, you were either mission critical or you were so widely spread across the organization that it was very difficult to rip and replace, you were still expecting a five-point decline compared to what you were pre-COVID. Um, typically attributable to concessions, changes in payment terms, et cetera. You won't lose the logo in those uh, mission critical applications, but you're still seeing contraction of revenue. If you were a, a, a non-sticky product, meaning you were at less than 80% gross retention to begin with, you were seeing heavy declines in those um, types of business. Um, because you're, you're more easily replaceable in that sense. Um, so across the board, we're seeing, um, we're seeing declines. Um, we also look, took a look at not just by retention rates, but also your annual contract value. This is also helpful in your own businesses uh, to do some retention forecasting. But if you were a, a cheaper product, uh, more transactional product, less than 5K in ACV, the decline is much higher than what you were seeing that people are seeing in the more um, more uh, heavy ACV products. Um, you can you can correlate it to the previous slide where the more expensive products are higher value, higher outcomes, and hence tend to be uh, more mission critical and more pervasive in most organizations. But you're seeing that spread um, across ACV values as well. This is not just true for gross retention, it's also true for net retention, which means it includes expansion. Um, even expansion is expected to contract uh, significantly because of COVID, um, which means people are, if folks were thinking about uh, doing more with your product, they're having, um, they're at least um, either stopping the decision altogether or they're pushing out the decision by a few months to figure out how the, uh, general economy is going to do and hence make their decision maybe in three months or six months um, or later in the year, which obviously has a huge impact on the annual numbers. All of these numbers are what folks are expecting for fiscal year 2020. Okay. Um, additional insights that we also gathered, um, churn, like a lot of churn is uh, expected more so than the average year is expected to come from downsell. Um, rather than true logo churn. Um, so folks are, you should expect that if you, if it's not happened already, you should expect that your customers are going to come in and ask for 
um, changes in payment terms, holding off on payments, additional discounts, additional free months um, types of conversations um, are pretty uh, commonplace now. Um, the second thing is there are certain industries that are obviously way worse affected like transportation and logistics. So if your product is very vertically oriented and sells into certain highly affected industries, that risk is that much bigger. Um, and, and I mentioned concessions are a hot topic. Um, the, the interesting part is like most 85% of the people we spoke to plan or uh, to keep or grow CSMs, which again goes back to the point that if you're not seeing improvement in new logo sales and new business, retaining and growing um, uh, your existing install base, customer base becomes that much more important. Uh, we spoke to uh, Dell uh, a couple of days back. They're actually translating and converting some of their sales reps into CSMs for the foreseeable future. So not just keep, but also grow CSMs. This may not mean going and hiring incremental people. This might actually mean converting some of your existing teammates and flexing uh, the organization to uh, put more uh, emphasis on the install. So um, let me pause here. That that was a, a lot of data and insights from what we're seeing with our customers and with the companies we spoke to. Um, for each one of you, maybe either on chat or if you want to uh, speak it out aloud, um, is this consistent? What amongst what I shared is consistent with what you're sh uh, sharing, what you're seeing, um, and also what is maybe a surprise to you um, and different in your business? Ashwin, um... I'll go, this is Abhi Engler from at and It's very consistent what we're seeing. Um, and we have a, uh, we've had to, we've had to really segment clients um, into those that are like super badly affected. Those are negative, those are neutral, and then anybody who's seeing growth. And then we are actively moving resources from one area to another area. And we're looking at both from a category perspective as well as the size of customer perspective, because on, SMB, we've done a ton of analysis on this area in terms of what's happened in the last four recessions, what was the length, the duration, the downturn, the correlation to bankruptcy rates, right? And then we've basically, um, I won't share what our numbers are for, uh, they're sensitive in terms of what bankruptcy rates would be, but we are kind of preparing for worst case scenarios if this drags on in the SMB state. And just to give you the average, the average for the last four recessions was 13% bankruptcy rates. Okay, but those were typically downturns in business of 20 to 30 percent. Very rarely have you seen a zero, like complete tap turn off situation of this sort. So we are in mm. really unknown, unknown uh, ground right now. And then we are taking uh, steps consistent with that segmentation in terms of how we're tagging. So your, your, your advice is very well, well taken. Awesome, and I love the notion of categorizing your customers um, most impacted and less impacted. I'm going to share some similar ideas, uh, Abhi, so that definitely resonates with me. Anyone else or um, uh, maybe the ecosystem team for things that are coming up on chat? Yeah, let's, um, one thing I wanted to ask Ashwin, first of all, I love some of this uh, analysis. I have a question, then I want to bring in Jen Camper, who's monitoring the chat. But one question for the community would be, are folks seeing, you know, sometimes this happens in very small, nefarious ways, where it's not so dramatic. I'm wondering how many folks are seeing that when they were thinking about doing something more, one of your key accounts was going to contemplate doing more, and now you're hearing it getting pushed out. You know, to what extent are we seeing some of these subtle indicators of slowdown with some of the key accounts. What are some of the thoughts from the team here? Hey, David Porter from Google, can you hear me okay? Yep, hi David. Yeah, just a comment. I mean, from our perspective, we took, um, we took a serve our client approach for sort of from the March, April timeframe, just empathize with their situations. Just a lot of conversations around impact and that is, um, it is what are they going through, uh, you know, getting from to work from home, um, can we support them there from a cloud environment? So we just kind of took a serve our customer approach, but we, what, what, it, what is translated as a lens we see is cost, cost optimization, whether it be through how they can dynamically optimize spend on cloud, 
whether where where if they're on premise, can they move more workloads to cloud to optimize, you know, reduce opex. So I would say those conversations are most prevalent in what we're seeing, and we're trying to support and and uh, from a value perspective, it's the value lens has definitely changed to a cost lens, uh, mm -hmm. and so we're supporting that that component of value selling. Yep, thank you, David. Makes sense too, given the economic environment. Jen, what's uh, what's some of the pulse happening in the chat room? Yeah, thanks for asking, Chad. So, um, Chris, I'm hoping I'm not going to butcher your last name here. Chris Goel from Cisco was talking a little bit about how they're seeing customers asking for COVID relief. And then I think um, on the flip side, so maybe let Chris talk about that a little bit, Andrew from HubSpot, Andrew Quinn is talking about how they've actually seen an increase in sales. So I think we're seeing a little bit of both across the chat and would love to hear more about that. Chris? Yep, I'll jump in. Hi, Chris Dole. Uh, I lead the customer success org for Cisco's cloud security division. So we've got a, a mixed bag of feedback. So starting with a bank of, you know, 19,000 customers or so, you know, everything from very, you know, top of the pyramid through a very, very long tail. Uh, it, it really is across the board. I've only thus far had, you know, a dozen or so, uh, you know, predominantly sizable customers come and seek, you know, some kind of relief, uh, you know, either better payment terms or, or deferred payment terms or credits or, uh, you know, incremental seats to help with work from home, et cetera. Um, and most of them have been, you know, businesses that are, you know, struggling or in, in, in duress in some way. And, uh, and we're, we've got various pro Cisco has various programs to help customers like that. Um, there's been one or two being honest, there's been one or two that feel very opportunistic. These have been historically, um, you know, challenging customers, uh, challenging to negotiate with, uh, not exactly looking for win-win, you know, relationships and, and partnerships. And, and those ones we've actually decided we're just going to hold the line because that's kind of a no-win situation kind of negotiating down from there. Um, but that's, I mean, that's very, you know, like it's maybe two, I've, I've dealt with two of those in the last few weeks. Um, on the flip side, and then I'll, I'll shut up here, but uh, on the flip side, because we're a cloud security and, and Cisco is a, a remote working, uh, you know, has a lot of tools for remote working, um, you know, our last quarter was very, very strong because, you know, as folks move from offices to remote working, I mean, they need a lot of the tool suite that Cisco systems offers. So, you know, it's been, it's been, we've had both the good and the bad and, and uh, you know, it, <laughs> interesting. It just makes for more and more work, <laughs> yeah. more and more work with new customers and more and more work trying to, you know, make uh, uh, customers that need help uh, more, more, more satisfied. So it's been very busy, but uh, anyway, Thanks, uh, thanks for inviting me, Chad and Kasha, and it's really a pleasure to meet uh, all of you folks. I really look forward to learning from all of you as well. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. No, we're happy to have you, and Cisco is part of the community. I'll uh, maybe bring it back to Ashvin. Yeah, happy to. Um, Chris, a lot of what you said definitely resonates um, even in our business, so um, definitely what we're seeing. Awesome. So um, let's I'll pivot now from what uh, we were, what we are seeing in the community to more around uh, ideas for how to actually minimize churn and get ahead of um, uh, some of the issues that we spoke about. Um, so like a big, big thing, um, and again, like we've tried to keep this pretty simple, but it's essentially starting with this notion of um, using your health score to prioritize where your team spend their time. Um, given that you have fewer resources or uh, as many resources to do more, start. not every customer is built the same. Um, your effort to save some of them um, might get wasted. So start thinking about where to actually spend your time and starting with that, uh, you, the, the unit of health score to start saying who actually is getting value from your product or adoption from your product and who enjoys like in the form of surveys, et cetera, if you've done any in the past six or 12 months, um, who's actually responding with positive client experiences. So that's a starting point. The second one, this might, this is in line Abhi, with what you were talking about, which is start categorizing your customers based on the business impact in their businesses. Um, obviously, Chris um, with the security team at Cisco 
um, and maybe Google with the cloud services, they're in category three, which are businesses that are actually doing really well in this climate uh, because of the need to work from home and because of the uh, uh, increased um, importance of remote working. And then you have the left-hand side, which is category one, companies that are not doing well in this form, uh, in this market. Typically what I've seen is for most companies, if you're not very vertically focused, you end up with like 20 to 30% of your business split between category one and three, but the messy middle, which is category two, ends up being the big chunk of your customer base. And there are several, to Chris's example, several in category two, um, companies that might come to you and opportunistically ask for discounts and concessions because every CFO right now is um, like either severely impacted in category one or is being opportunistic in category two and are going to ask for um, some form of payment term changes, et cetera, because, well, they can in this market. Um, and I, and so, I want to go, uh, go, go on record yeah, Adam, that uh, we did not, share content. We did not talk before this and I did, I was not set up to, as the shill to segue. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm glad it played in nicely. Love it. <laughs> um, yes. And, and like what we're also seeing related to that is like, uh, do the simple thing, whether you do it in, this is a view from Gainsight, but if you don't have Gainsight, um, even creating something simple in a Google spreadsheet or in Excel spreadsheet, which just says, here is the COVID impact, start assigning a red, yellow, green to each one of your customers. Um, and just saying like what the actual impact is for their business, whether it's negative, whether you're a category one or a category two or a category three, will quickly tell your company, your sales team, CSM teams, everyone in the field, where to focus their energies and actually go start having conversations. Um, and then like start taking a lens for each one of those three categories or the red, yellow, greens to say, maybe category one is going to churn at a high rate, no matter what you do. So um, is that the right place to invest the highly um, valuable human resources that you might have on the team? Um, maybe category one should be an example of where you go completely digital. You still reach out to them and have a conversation to save them and have meaningful conversations about outcomes, but it's all um, heavily digital and scaled versus um, reaching out with using human beings. Category two, on the other hand, you have a pretty high, um, you could have a pretty high impact and save more than you originally thought you would. Um, and in this case, like this is an area where you might want to invest human beings, invest resources, Maybe if you have professional services or managed services, you actually invest that to bring them to good health so that you convert um, a higher percentage of customers um, and retain them versus otherwise what you would have seen um, given the health of your customers. And then on the third one, which is category three who are actually going through a positive impact, start focusing your sales and CS resources, collaborating better between them um, to uh, talk about expansion, the limited expansion that you could possibly see in your install base likely will come from category three. And so start thinking about how to uh, collaborate between teams better um, and focus your energies there. Um, this is a couple of examples of how Gainsight and Ecosystem uh, has collaborated with a few of our customers at Athena Health and Autodesk, uh, to name a couple of the many that we've worked on. Um, but what we did with both of them is start quantifying the outcomes that you saw. So the screenshot that you see is of Gainsight Customer 360 with a section on there which is um, directly derived from the work that we do with ecosystem and from their software. So we've started quantifying what your base case, uh, baseline looked like for certain metrics. In this case, it is the reduced risk to secure cloud service adoption as an example. And then what the actual impact is because you are focused on delivering outcomes and experiences to your customers, what that now looks like in the, in the new world, in year two and year three. Um, so starting to quantify that both from top line, like how can we retain more customers uh, using Gainsight, and then also the bottom line, which is how can we add more efficiency to your um, CSMs, um, and hence like you can do more with the existing CSMs. But the value of actually, part one is delivering value, part two is actually showing that value and having 
um, the, the conversation with your customers for value delivered. Both are equally important and partnering with ecosystem has enabled us to do that um, in, the, in these examples. Um, and then uh, this is another example of how we were able to do that um, to actually show uh, the increased top line as well as improve productivity and actually putting a dollar value to it. it in our executive business reviews, uh, having this level of conversation has definitely changed the dynamic for what we are talking about. We moved past talking about adoption metrics um, to the so what of that adoption. Just because you're using Gainsight doesn't mean anything. What does that actually mean in terms of improving revenue or uh, saving you costs? And this view has helped us significantly um, to talk about it. Um, and I specifically like that summary view that you see on the right-hand side because it helps me then say the total value delivered is X million of that here are the three or four pieces that makes up for it. Now let's debate um, whether these seem right, whether um, like the actual math that went into it, et cetera, which is for a way more meaningful and up-leveled conversation than just talking about low level adoption metrics. So um, lots of, this is, if there was ever a time to talk about value delivery, right now is the time because um, install base retention and expansion and install base is that much more critical. Cool. And then um, after you define those categories that we spoke about and talk about health scores, like a few things that um, I mentioned earlier, um, a thing that we are highly recommending is for category one, start using tech touch. This is a view from our journey orchestrator, which is like a digital uh, part of Gainsight, like emails, uh, APIs, in-app communications, all of that good stuff. Start leveraging those because you, you don't have the resources to attack category one. For category two, start thinking about investing professional services, resources, CSMs. Um, several of our customers, as I mentioned earlier, have moved people from inside sales and um, uh, account executives over to CSM uh, roles. They've moved SC sales engineers over to professional services for the near term so that we can actually do more work with the install base versus um, like spending time with prospective customers. Uh, again, like at this point, everything, like nothing is being run as quarters. Everything is being run as months at this point. So uh, on a month to month basis, let's think about flex capacity, which team has extra capacity that can be uh, diverted towards customers um, is the way a lot of companies are running their business now. Okay. Um, and then like at this point, like omnichannel, a lot of you already have strategies for omnichannel, um, but communication right now is so critical um, and, and staying relevant to um, your customers is so critical at this point. And uh, in B2B world, which is where all of us live, you're not dealing with a customer or an account, you're de dealing with people at the customer. And those people come in all shapes and sizes. You're probably working with CIOs, you're working with chief security officers, you're working with end users who are actually using your product, you're working with the CEOs, CFOs in some situations, uh, and then GMs in certain other situations. So you need to make sure that you are uh, using the right channel to get to each one of these stakeholders. You need to get to all of those stakeholders and you need to use different channels. In some situations, you might choose to use SMS to even tap into um, like extremely critical uh, systems down type issue or support issues that you want to quickly flag for your uh, customers. So uh, leverage all of these channels, like be ahead and communicate more than you generally did. And most importantly, like the flip side or the other side of the coin to what I'm saying is you also want to be very cognizant of not over um, spamming your customers. So making sure that it's all very deliberate and very um, coordinated across these different channels. Um, so all of those need to be kept in mind even more so than, than before. So um, these are a few ideas for what we are seeing our customers and the community doing. So again, lots of words, lots of slides. I will now pivot back to maybe hearing from all of you, like uh, any of these that resonate that you're already doing or additional ideas that you're doing within your companies to minimize churn. We'd love to learn uh, from all of you. Uh, 
Absolutely. Great stuff. Uh, and I'm just going to kind of package some key insights that Ashwin just went through, and then I'm going to open it up to the community and then maybe check in with Jen in the chat room. So I love this idea of using the health scorecard to prioritize your time, you know, being more uh, deliberate on where our time allocations are in a very tough environment. It seems like to Avi's earlier comment about categorization and then Ashwin's discussion of category one, two, and three, and being able to say, you know, there's different levels of treatment. Maybe it's digital and uh, low touch upwards to more high touch for those key opportunities. And then the final point that really resonated on this ability to quantify value, up level it from just metrics on adoption to actually business impact. What does the group think about those three or what are things that weren't mentioned that you'd like to bring up as to how you're dealing with this new normal and the various different strategies? Hey, Chad, it's, it's, Chad, Chad yeah. it's, uh, it's Eric uh, Almquist from Baden Company. Um, Hi, Eric. Hi, I just wanted to chime in on this. Uh, a comment I made in the chat box is that uh, it, I really agree that de-averaging your customer base is, is super important here. And uh, the reason is that this, this recession is incredibly not uniform. <laughs> uh, it is very heterogeneous. Just to give you some statistics, these are as of May 3rd, and these, I'm reading this from my phone, I apologize, but uh, this is year over year, as of May 3rd, the cinema industry is down 99% in revenue. Okay, it's 99.99 probably. Um, as of two weeks ago, there was one theater open in the country, which was a drive-in in Florida. Uh, just to give you a sense, I mean, that and, and that happened over the course of, you know, a week and a half or something, probably depending on, you know, the state. Uh, these are some of the most rapid changes in consumer behavior we have seen ever in human history. Um, you know, this is faster. You know, 9/11 shut things down very quickly, but it was mostly in New York City, and then it was the airlines you know, across the country, it had a, it had effect, but it was mostly North America um, and, and it was over, you know, with, with or, or coming back pretty quickly. Uh, but this is just extraordinary. At the other end of this spectrum, you've got uh, industries that are up significantly, like discount stores are up into 70% year over year. Grocery is up, um, you know, I can go down the list. So as you think about your customer bases, your B2B, but think about who your customers are serving because they may be serving industries that are frankly in, in growth mode at the moment, or it could be that they're in steep decline. So think about your customers, customers and what segments they're serving. Excellent point. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, Chad, this is uh, Sumesh, can you hear me okay? Hi, we can Sumesh, please. Yeah, yeah I, I would like to extend to what Eric mentioned. Uh, to uh, research about the customer's customer. So Ashwin, you made a great point. It's not about uh, going month to month. In, in my case, at FIS Global, it's week to week. So we have uh, deployed some of our uh, account executives as well as CS into PS roles because of uh, actually selling a lot of solutions in Q1. And uh, the, the theme internally is uh, the three Cs, which is communicate, collaborate, and talk to clients about how we can change in terms of either increasing their revenue or it's all about operating costs. Uh, so we have certain solutions which are meant, like Chris mentioned, for remote productivity. And everyone is either thinking about saving real estate space or looking at the OPEX. So I have seen a different change in customers actually uh, uh, embracing uh, different ideas for change and more importantly, really, as long as you deliver that value and show them you're a trusted partner, I think it's, it's less about being apprehensive about churn. It's more about how can we deliver value and, and adapt change together. So as, as the team says, better together. Absolutely. Thank you, Sumesh. Love it. And I, by the way, like one takeaway for me from what Sumesh said was also um, like flipping it to be more, almost going on the offense and like creating that value story as opposed to being on the defense and 
defending the value. Um, and so like more people in PS is such a great idea to start doing more and more and more very quickly um, with the people that you have. Yeah, just to reinforce Ashwin's point, in our discussions with members, I've never seen the speed of innovation or pivot in this crisis as I have with companies. Um, so there is this silver lining that this forcing function is creating a urgency to innovate uh, and change the business model that has not been seen at a pace uh, this quickly. So that, that's exciting for us as we think in, into our businesses. Any other questions on, or thoughts on, um, you know, the best part of this community is the collective wisdom. What are other things that you're doing in your businesses to minimize churn, either from the chat room or for folks to speak out direct that we're hearing? Let's go to Jen in the chat room. Jen, anything coming up from the, the dialogue? Yeah, I'd love to hear from Andrew Quinn. We kind of were talking about it a little bit earlier in the chat about how this has uh, impacted HubSpot. So we talked a little bit on pre-sales and some of the challenges that you're having in post-sales. Andrew, could you maybe share with the group what you're seeing at HubSpot? Sure. So I think what's interesting is, you know, from a, a macroeconomic sense, right, we've had an incredibly long bull run. And this has really pressure tested a lot of business models. And what we're really seeing is, and it goes to something that Ashvin put up about the importance of coordinated communications. And we just happen to find ourselves in a unique spot where we sell the tools that make that easy to do. Um, I'm not, not going to turn this into a HubSpot ad, but like we sell a bunch of interconnected marketing, sales, and services tools that actually allow for that. Um, integrated communication, which avoids spam, which ensures that the right things get to the right people in the right sequence. The sales knows what marketing's doing and services knows what they're doing. And it was very easy for us to spin up opportunity dashboards that are zeroed in on those industries that are doing well to Eric's point. Like it's very asynchronous in the way this is affecting various sectors of the economy. And it was fairly easy for us to spin up opportunity dashboards for reps that locked in on segments that are doing well allowed us to identify those segments where we're going to have some pressure on existing customers. And we, we leaned very heavily into um, being with them for the long haul. You know, as a SaaS business, as a subscription business, um, we were very aggressive in helping people navigate this situation so that ideally they make it through the entire, you know, situation, come out the other end. And we can then ramp them back up again to whatever their their you know pre-COVID subscription price was. Um, and we've done a lot of that with our partners as well, like prepaying partner commissions so that they can stay sustained as agencies. Um, we really just leaned heavily into trying to keep the community together, um, and and it's worked well. And and the other thing is as as business models have been tested, um, there's a lot of companies that realize that they've got gaps in the way in which they're dealing with their, their go-to-market flywheel um, from how they find prospects, sell them, turn them into customers, turn those customers into promoters. And we've seen exceptional, like we had one of our best months in quite a while in April, um, which was really surprising. Um, and you know, we, we're, we're in a good fortune that we've created a lot of educational resources. We have this whole environment called the HubSpot Academy that basically provides in-depth coursework and IP on how to be a better marketer, how to be a better um, you know, seller in a new environment. Um, seen an incredible spike in interest in that. And that generates sales leads for us. Um, so we've seen a lot of movement in a positive way um, because of all that pre-investment we've done on the educational side um, for companies to be more effective in a digital environment. Hope that's helpful. Very cool. No, it does, Andrew, absolutely. It's, uh... You know, not all industries are affected the same, and, and you guys are capitalizing. Um, I would love, you know, I just saw Melinda, who's a new member. Hate to put, I don't want to put you on the spot, Melinda, but welcome. We're excited to have you. Tell me, how is it, how are you faring, or what's some of the thoughts you have at WeWork as you tackle this new normal? Yeah, I don't know that I have a ton of comments on the, on the WeWork situation right now. They're obviously, you know, very challenged with the, the current situation. This is essentially a, a, a direct hit on their business model, right? So I think that would put them in the category of 
um, you know, working through that challenge, as Ashvin mentioned, many industries are having that direct impact. Um, I have been, I joined WeWork a year ago to lead customer success on the technology side of the organization. And that was when WeWork was investing really heavily on uh, the technology infrastructure to complement the space business. And so that uh, they've essentially divested of that business. So um, I'm in a, in a bit of a transition at WeWork as well. I think one thing that I, I am finding really interesting about this situation is um, I was at Salesforce from 2004 to 2014 and was, um, you know, had a front, front row seat to how Salesforce navigated the economic downturn of 2008. And the reality is they actually came out stronger out of that economic downturn. And I think that all of the insights that have been shared today are, are spot on. Um, especially a lot of the data that the Ashton has shared. One thing that I, I think was um, that directly contributed to Salesforce's ability to come out of the stronger was their core belief in putting the customer first. And I think that every single strategy that we've talked about today is spot on, but that presumes that you have the internal muscle and the culture and the value system of customer success and putting customers at the center of everything that you're doing. Um, I think all of these playbooks and communication strategies are spot on, but if you're not in a position to, I think the companies that, that don't have those playbooks, the companies that don't have that value set are the ones that are particularly challenged in being able to pivot in this crisis. Salesforce was able to pivot very quickly. They're regenerating currently a lot of the same playbooks that they um, used in the 2008 downturn a lot of which is actually uh, turning account executives into a bit of customer success managers and whatnot. So it's infusing the customer success strategy throughout the all roles in the business and ensuring that everyone in the organization is focused on the people and understanding the person that's on the, on the other end of the phone um, and also understanding what can they do to support them during this time and being yeah. able to respond to that. So, um, you know, I think for me, kind of it's fascinating walk going through this experience now with this lens of having gone through it with a company that I think handled it really well. Um, and this is obviously completely different than the economic downturn of 2008 in so many ways, but um, definitely appreciate the opportunity to be part of this particular ecosystem. And uh, I think there's a lot of amazing talent. In this Chad, program. if I could jump in for a quick second. Yeah, great comments. Thank you. Sure, please. Um, I, I couldn't agree more with what Melinda just said. Like, I tend to take it for granted, having been at HubSpot for 11 years, that we've created that culture that she talks about. So like the move in this situation has been minimally disruptive to our business. Like even just moving from, you know, offices to remote, we had 400 employees that work remote to begin with. So shifting the remaining, you know, 3,000 of them to work remote, you'd already solved it for 400, so it's not that hard to solve it for the rest. Um, but that the, the, un, the cultural underpinnings play such a huge role in your ability to navigate unknown situations like this. I just, I thank you for sharing that, Melinda. I think it just, it reinforces for me, like, just how important that is. Sometimes I forget about that, when you've been involved with yourself. Great point. Thank you, guys. Um, I may call a little cold call again before we uh, bring back into. I'd love Sanjay's new to Amazon, AWS. How are so probably your lens is uh, still developing on this. But what's your thoughts on how in your leadership role at AWS and they're tackling this issue right now? I think it's very similar to you know some of the other you know commentary that we just heard. It's, you know, we're putting the customer in the middle and kind of focusing, you know, focusing on them. Uh, we are in a bit of a unique situation where, uh, you know, we've actually seen growth during this time, uh, especially with customers who were looking at moving into the cloud have actually accelerated a lot of their, you know, move into the cloud because that's the only way they can actually, you know, kind of continue to, you know, you know, you know, you know, continue to kind of, you know, run their businesses. Uh, 
I'm specifically focusing on professional services, and we're actually seeing the same, you know, uptick there. You know that uh, you know, we're seeing a big, you know, increase in the use of our professional services. Uh, you know, we're continuing to grow that organization. We're not stopping to, you know, uh, uh, you know, in terms of recruitment and hiring, uh, we we're actually increasing it. So we're actually seeing um, that acceleration that's taking place. Uh, we're seeing kind of geographic, uh, you know, hotspots as well. And this is, you know, like before I came to AWS, I was actually at Microsoft as well. So I've got this kind of view between, you know, between the two. Um, uh, we actually saw, you know, like earlier in the year, uh, you know, this is at Microsoft and I think it was very similar, you know, at AWS was during that kind of Feb January, February timeline when, you know, uh, Asia was starting to, you know, uh, turn down. Um, they actually didn't have the infrastructure for home working, uh, you know, some of the teams which we had had no internet at home. Um, our customers didn't have internet at home, so you just couldn't even do business. So there was this whole acceleration of how do you, you know, just get them connected, you know, basic services, you know, to bring, you know, to bring them on. on. So you could, they could actually do business and we could do business and very similar, uh, you know, kind of pattern that I've heard, you know, here at AWS as well. So um, same kind of thing, we're in a little bit of a unique situation. We've seen that growth. Uh, we've also got the, you know, the retail side, um, huge growth on that side, that side as well. That's kind of draw, you know, grown our kind of, uh, you know, consumption business as well. Um, so unique situation, but uh, you know, customer in the middle, and everything that we're doing is centered around how do we help our customers, you know, in, uh, you know, during the kind of, you know, during this, uh, you know, this crisis. Uh, um, you know, Ashwin mentioned that kind of messy middle, and, and that's where the big focus is. How do we help people in that messy middle? Uh, you know, because that's really where, you know, we need to, you know, we can actually kind of, you know, help and, you know, and sustain our kind of customer growth, you know, customer base. Category one, we're going to see some churn there. There's, you know, there's not much we can uh, see there, but we do see like those top tier one customers in, especially like for example in energy, who are really accelerating to say, okay, let's you know reduce costs, get cost out, and you know uh, accelerate that move to the cloud. Great perspective, thank you, Sanjay. I'll turn it back to Ashvin. Thanks, Chad. That was awesome. Um, very very useful insights. One. One other notion I'll, I'll leave with you, may, some of you probably are already executing on something similar, is this idea of if, if you're fortunate enough to see some growth in this climate and or there is at least a segment of your customer base that is going through a growth spurt, um, I've seen companies bring together these working pods where uh, someone from professional services, someone from sales, someone from... CSM um, support, pro even product for that matter, you basically are creating these pods that are focused on a common group of customers. These people start getting to work together really well and their key focus is net retention, including expansion in that customer base. Um, is like I'm seeing and creating like the, who is responsible, who's accountable for motions within that pod. Like I'm seeing more momentum um, in companies doing that than I've ever seen before. Um, so, one other notion to add uh, for how companies are dealing with this situation. Cool. Um, let me continue. Um, one uh, shameless plug for uh, Pulse Everywhere, which is our annual conference. It's not a user conference, but a community conference of um, uh, people who are generally customer centric, who are customer focused on um, working with the install base and customer base. Um, we used to do this at the Moscone Center till last year. Obviously, can't do that anymore this year. Um, so we are hosting this May 13th and 14th next week. Um, already are at 15,000 registrants. Um, so we're seeing a massive um, influx of people who are just generally interested in this climate to learn about um, how to work with customers, how to work with the install base. So any of you um, interested um, would highly um, encourage and would love to have all of you join. Um, it's two half day sessions basically. Um, and lots of uh, companies from across the board, Adobe, um, Cisco, um, et cetera, talking about uh, what they're doing in the world of customer success um, and in the world of product uh, success as well. Chad? Yep, 
Thank you, Ashvin. Um, and before, I, I want to just thank Ashvin for a wonderful session and facilitating it. He's such a, a core member of our community, and I really am grateful for the time he took today to share not only the insights with the research, which was provocative, but just this kind of, I love this section where we could break out in a community and talk through what we're seeing and, and what we're all experiencing and kind of playing off of each other. So thank you so much, Ashvin, for your leadership in the session today. Grateful for it. Grateful for you to be a member in the community. Thanks for having me. It was, it was great. So one last um, item for the members to uh, think through and just plan around. So we are, uh, what is exciting in this community is not only its growth. You know, you heard from today Cisco, HubSpot, Amazon, AWS, Bain, WeWork. We just had a great growing community. We're now going to start to pivot into kind of a workshop mindset where we actually drive into some issues and begin to workshop them, um, and anyone can self-select into it. So if you have a real interest in a particular area, uh, let us know. These are two events that are coming up. One is David Coker, who's the Vice President of Customer Success at Metadata Solutions. He is going to be chair of the Customer Success Track, and he's going to be featuring a conversation, a virtual workshop, on the B2B elements of value. Eric spoke today. Uh, Eric Omquist, uh, partner at Bain, and this is wonderful thought leadership research that Bain has put forward around the value pyramid. And David's going to take that, and with your, your uh, support and collaboration, begin to see how do we actually operationalize this in our business? How do we take this very thoughtful content and make sure that we're looking at it in the most uh, elegant way possible for our business and around retention and growth for accounts? So think, uh, be on the outlook for that. That's May the 21st. And then we also have another session coming up, which features the chair, the newly appointed chair of our value management track, Eric Ranta. And Eric is director of the Value Cloud Advisors for Google. And he'll be leading this conversation. Boy, this is a topic we are so excited and hear so much about around accelerating value realization. And much to Ashvin's point about the research of how do we up-level to kind of a business impact, we're going to have an entire workshop with uh, you, the leaders out there, on how do we accelerate it, what are we doing, what levels are we at right now, what are things that we can learn from each other. So two great sessions in kind of a workshop mode that will be coming up in the May late May time frame in early June, and we're excited to let you know. And we have some other big announcements coming in the fall, so stay tuned on that front as well. So with that, I will thank the community for everybody and your participation. Final note on this, just to know, we are, because the community is growing so vibrantly, we want to do as much surveying of you. Everything we put together, our commitment, is it's going to be member-driven, member-led. This whole conversation was driven based on member interest. So we are surveying on different aspects of the workshops that are coming up, that value realization workshop, as well as the B2B elements of value workshop. So there will be a survey that comes to your uh, attention. Please take a moment. Promise it's effortless. It's quick. Just a couple key questions to get a sense of where your interests lie. We take in that, we think about it, we're, we're neurotic in that, about making sure that it fits, all this content fits your unique interest in Hot Buttons. So be on the lookout for the four question survey that comes uh, your way as an outcome from our session today. With that, I'm going to wish everyone a wonderful day. I hope uh, you are in the midst of great conversations and value-based discussions with your prospects and customers. And stay safe, stay healthy, and thanks all.